thanks everybody for, for coming. My name is Seth Smith. I'm a public services librarian here with the Daniel Boone Regional Library. Um, really want to welcome Lynn Rotti here with this. Uh, it's a great program. I actually have this book at home. Uh, my wife and I do, and uh, it's just uh, actually been really, uh, really useful for, for us. Um, so I, I think this is, this is going to be a, a great program. Um, so yeah, for tonight's program at the library, we are all about literacy. And not only does that mean uh, information literacy but, uh, re and reading, but health literacy as well. Um, as, and I ran a lot of different uh, programs about new, uh, media literacy this, this last uh, spring too. So lots of different kinds of literacy. But health literacy is incredibly important. You know, as you know, right now with uh, uh, COVID still uh, happening uh, and uh, you know, I, I think there's a lot, lot to learn. Um, and Dr. Lynn Rossi is with us this evening, and she specializes in mindful eating, moving, and living. And she developed a 10-week Eat for Life class that teaches people to eat mindfully and intuitively, love their bodies, and find deeper meaning in their lives. Her book, The Mindfulness-Based Eating Solution, is, look, solution, is based on the concepts and eat for life. Lynn is a lifetime pra practitioner of mindfulness meditation and is a yoga, certi yoga certified in Kripalu, is that correct? Is that okay? Mm -hmm. um, and energy medicine yoga and teaches yoga locally at Alley Cat Yoga Center. And she's currently the president of the Center for, Center for Mindful Eating. So um, tonight she is actually here to talk about her latest book, Savor Every Bite, Mindful Ways to Eat love your body, and live with joy. And let's please welcome Lynn Rossi. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm really excited to be here and talk about my new book, um, Savor Every Bite. It was a lot of fun to write, I have to say. And um, I really wrote it in response to the many years that I've taught mindful eating um, and really wanted to put little small practices that people could do um, that relate to the issues that I saw that people faced uh, when they try to eat mindfully, love their body, and live with joy. <laughs> so my class is pretty holistic. I don't just um, I don't just talk about eating. I don't just talk about the act of putting food in your mouth and tasting it and eating. I really feel like I I like to. Uh, approach the whole person that shows up at the dinner table. And so the whole person comes with a variety of emotions and thoughts and, and a past and conditioning and triggers. And so I don't feel it like I do anybody justice if I just talk about, well, let's just eat a bite of food, but let's see uh, and talk about who you are as a person who's taking that bite of food. And so um, today, well, there I am. He already told you all the things that I do. Um, and here's the book. It's available at the library, at Skylark Bookstore, wherever books are sold. Cute little cover. I kind of like the little bowls. Um, that made me happy. Um, so what we'll learn today is um, the five sections of the book, uh, which there's five steps. And within each of the five steps, there's 10 small chapters and 10 savoring practices, what I call savoring practices that you can do. And so you can do one for a while. You can, you know, it's, it's a book to be taken slowly and not to be rushed through, but to be practiced, right? Mindfulness has to be practiced. You can't read mindfulness and use it in your life without actually practicing it. So step one is to slow down and explore your senses. Step two is to soothe instead of eat your emotions. Step three is to surrender limiting thoughts. And I've outlined a, a number of them, 10 of them, in fact, that I often run up against when I'm teaching this class. Step four is to smile and create your own happiness. And five is to savor every moment. Okay, I'm gonna give you just a little bit of a taste of each one of those sections, and then we'll have time to talk about it. So slow down and explore your senses right? You have to slow down in order to explore your senses because most of us are moving too fast. I love this quote by Leonardo da Vinci and I put it in about every single one of my presentations because I love it so much. 
because it exactly describes us as human beings. So Leonardo da Vinci was a pretty smart guy. And he said the average person looks without seeing, listens without hearing, touches without feeling, eats without tasting, moves without physical awareness, inhales without awareness of odor or fragrances, and talks without thinking. I'm seeing Catherine shake her head yes. <laughs> and most people do that, right? I get this little nod and I just love the little nod, right? It's like, uh, yeah, that would be me, right? So think about the consequences of that kind of living, right? If you're not seeing, if you're not hearing, if you're not touching, if you're not tasting, if you're not smelling, you know, it's like we miss out on our lives. And it's been estimated that we miss out on about 50% of our lives because we're lost in thought, right? Plain and simple. We're thinking about the past, we're thinking about the future, and the, and the moment is gone. The smell is gone. The beauty of the sunset is gone. The beauty of the flower is gone. The beauty of the taste is gone. We just don't get it. And so that's why I love teaching mindfulness because I, I see these senses come alive in people. So what is mindfulness? What are we talking about here? Um, so John Kabat-Zinn is the one who really put mindfulness on the map in the secular world. Um, and he said, it's paying attention in a particular way. First of all, it's on purpose. So we set the intention to be present. Second, it's in the present moment. Our attention is on what's happening now, whether it's the breath, a sound, a touch, a taste. And it's done with a particular type of attitude. It's the attitude of non-judgment, or I like to say with kindness and compassion and, you know, and openness and acceptance and patience and trust, right? All of these attitudinal qualities are part of being present in a mindful way. And it's a skill that can be learned, right? Mindfulness is a skill. So I've got this little guy with he's lifting or girl lifting weights. It's the brain. And it's, it's a skill that we train the brain to do. And the heart, actually, I should have a heart there too. It's training the heart mind to be present with kindness, right? Um, and this presence with kindness and compassion and openness and curiosity gives us choices. We come into the present moment with a beginner's mind. So in order to practice mindfulness, it, it helps if you slow down, right? And go, well, wait a minute, let's stop. What's going on? Explore your senses. So for instance, when I teach mindful eating, I ask people to become aware of their hunger, right? So one of the little savoring practices that I have in the first section is about being aware of your hunger. You know, before you eat, take five deep breaths. <sighs> Just take some deep breaths with me now, right? And when you're taking those deep breaths, you're actually activating the parasympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system is your rest and digest response, right? When you're not relaxed and you eat, your body isn't prepared for food. So awareness of hunger, are you physically hungry before you eat? Most people never check in with that. They just eat because it's eight o'clock, noon and seven, right? Or they eat because there's food in front of them. Instead of like asking yourself, well, am I physically hungry right now? Why am I reaching for food? If I'm reaching for food because I'm physically hungry, that's a great time to eat. But if I'm reaching for food because I'm bored or I'm sad or I'm lonely or just because it's in the environment, that might not be the best time to eat. At that point in time, you can ask yourself, what am I really hungry for? Maybe I'm hungry for movement. Maybe I'm hungry for some water or connection with somebody or rest, right? We're hungry for a lot of things that we often turn to food for. Right. And food is mainly meant to satisfy physical hunger and, of course, pleasure. Right. It's always great to have pleasure with food. So are you aware of your hunger? That's one of the savoring practices is to slow down and be aware. Am I hungry or not before you eat and begin to discover how often do you reach for food when you really want something else? Right. You might be really surprised. Another um, savoring practice that I really love 
is one that I call uh, do what's important, not urgent. And so I came about this practice from reading a book called Looking at Mindfulness, 25 Ways to Live in the Moment Through Art, which is a fascinating book if you haven't seen it. It's by Christopher Andre, who's a psychiatrist in Paris, actually. And he says, I'm just going to read this to you. He says, every day the things that are urgent in our lives come into conflict with those that are important. He goes on to add, if I don't do what's important, nothing will happen to me, at least not immediately. But gradually, my life will become drab, sad, or strangely lacking in meaning. Since I read that, I really haven't ever looked at these two things, the urgent and the important, in the same way. Because so much of our lives can get dragged off to what's urgent, cleaning off the email from your computer, you know, my presentation preps, you know, interviews, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, to-do lists, TV, you know, whatever it is. Um, but what's important for me, and I've just put what's important for me here, is to do yoga on a regular basis because that brings me in alignment with my body and my mind and my heart. Meditation practice is important to me. Connection with family and friends, connection with nature, playing the piano, gardening, and cooking. These are the things that I know are important to me. They feed my soul, right? And if I don't really know what's important and make time for those, they get eaten up by the urgent, right? So one of the savoring practices is to really touch into what's important to me. What makes my heart sing? Because when we're living our lives out of that place of what makes my heart sing, then the rest of our lives work a lot better. So slow down. What you can do is just, just to slow down before you make a choice, before you eat, before you make plans, before you send an email, before you say yes or no to any particular thing. Really pay attention to what master are you feeding? Are you feeding the urgent? Or are you feeding the important? And if you're not feeding the important enough, you might want to start making different choices. And slowing down before we make a choice and really being mindful about it can very, be very helpful in that process. Step two, this is, a, this is a big one, right? Soothe instead of eat your emotions. Okay, so a lot of people that come to my classes eat for a, a lot of different reasons besides they're physically hungry, right? Um, in fact, the top reason um, that people report to me, the reason why they eat more than they want to is because they're eating because of their emotions. They're eating to soothe themselves when they're sad or when they're lonely or when they're just simply bored. And they don't have the skill to be with their emotions. I think this is one of the saddest things actually. Um, and it's why I'm passionate about teaching mindfulness is that people have not been taught that they can be with their emotions in a way that helps them um, move through them instead of having to avoid them, fix them, or think that there's something wrong. So one of the ways that we deal with emotions with mindfulness is that we learn what the emotions are that we're having, right? And so I really encourage people to keep a record of what are you feeling in your body what are your emotions or feelings and what are your thoughts, right? There's been some research done um, that looks at the effects of the br brain on actually labeling our emotions, right? So you have to name it to tame it. That's the saying, I think it's uh, Dan Siegel that said that. So when we label our emotions, it actually dampens down the amygdala, which is part of our reaction to difficult emotions. So let's just do a little meditation right now and let's see how uh, well you do at labeling what's going on with you. So let's just close our eyes and take your attention inside. First of all, notice what the body feels like. Notice if the body feels relaxed, if it feels tired, if it feels energized, places that you notice that might be achy, places that feel um, fairly neutral,
places that feel warm inside the body, places that feel cool. Notice at the belly, are you experiencing hunger or are you experiencing satiety, depending on when you've eaten last? You can tell a lot by, uh, about the body just by stopping and checking in with your eyes closed, blocking out the external distractions, dropping inside. And once you know what the body feels like, then turn to your emotion. Can you label an emotion that's here right now? Are you happy, sad, confused, bored, disappointed, encouraged, interested, curious? This can be a little tricky for people sometimes. We're not used to labeling what we're feeling with a word. And emotions are one word. They're not a sentence. They're one word. Happy, sad, mad, glad, angry. And then notice what thoughts are going through your mind. Our thoughts and our emotions and our body sensations are linked together. If I'm feeling overwhelmed, I'm probably having thoughts about my to-do list or what went wrong or what's gonna go wrong. If I'm feeling happy, I'm having a thought about something that's bringing me joy. See if you can connect a thought to an emotion that you're having currently. And once we know what the body feels like and what we're thinking and feeling, just bring your attention to the breath for a moment. Feel the breath as the movement of the belly, the chest as the breath comes in. It expands and deflates as the breath goes out. Resting with the breath for just a moment. And then when you're ready, opening your eyes and just make a note perhaps of what you felt in your body, what feelings you were having and what thoughts you were having. And if you would check in with yourself three or four times a day, I call it visiting yourself, you can begin to get a lot better at understanding yourself. It's so amazing that we're so outwardly focused that we don't check in with ourselves and know ourselves, right? Um, and the, the most important relationship that you'll ever have is with yourself. So it's, it'll be good to cultivate this understanding of what you're feeling and what you're thinking. And if you're feeling something difficult, just that labeling it sometimes can give you instant relief, relief from it. I know sometimes I'm like, I'll be walking around going, what's, what's wrong? I'm not quite right. And I'm like, well, so what are you feeling? And it might be disappointment, right? Or it might be sadness. And the minute that I label what it is that I'm feeling, it's almost like I've, I've heard myself. I've acknowledged myself. And there's a relief that comes from that. And again, it's been studied. There's good research that indicates that this has a, has a wonderful effect on us. So there's a wonderful technique called RAIN, and it helps us be with these difficult emotions that we might have. And if you are interested in a longer version of that meditation, I have one on my, <clears throat> excuse me, on my website at lynnrossi.com on the multimedia page. I have all the meditations that I do in all of my classes. They're free, you can download them. But RAIN stands for recognize, allow, investigate, non-identification or nurture. Right. And so I'm going to take you through a brief exercise. I have a longer version on my website, but let's just try a little bit of rain to give you an idea of, of how this works. OK, so I'd like to invite you to begin by settling into a comfortable position and take a breath in. 
<sighs> let it out with a sigh. Relax the shoulders, the jaw. Let the hands just rest into your lap. And then call to mind a situation in your life that brings up a challenging emotion. It might be an argument that you had with somebody or an email that you got that you didn't like or something that's happening in the world that brings up a challenging emotion for you. Not the most challenging thing that you've ever that you're facing, but maybe something mild to start out with. <sighs> and allow the awareness of the situation to become vivid in your mind. So notice where you were when the emotions happened, when they got triggered, what people are involved. Noticing any details of the situation and the unpleasant emotions um, that arose. <clears throat> and then starting with the R of rain, recognizing what are you feeling? You might be feeling angry or hurt. There might be fear or confusion or anxiety or disappointment. Taking the time and labeling the feeling as accurately as you can. Labeling the feeling. And then A stands for allow or acknowledge. Just to allow the emotion to be there with kindness, allowing the feelings to be just as they are making space for the feeling to be here. You might take a deep breath. You might even wanna place your hands over your heart and maybe saying sadness is here. Sadness is just what, is what wants to be here right now. Sadness is present. See if you can allow for it just to be here, whatever it feels like in the body, in the heart, in the mind, and really then move to I, investigate. What's the di most difficult part of that? Notice what's happening in your body. Is it aroused or tense? What stories are you telling yourself about this situation? About yourself, about the other people involved? Realizing that there's a story that often goes along with the feelings. And maybe considering, are these stories completely true? Maybe there's something else that's true as well. Mindfulness asks us to open our awareness to the possibility that all of our stories may not be true. There may be other truths you might discover something completely different than what you thought. And just investigate what does it feel like? It, it has an ouch to it, feel that. Acknowledge that it hurts. And then N stands for non-identification and nurture. So we don't identify with the feeling as who we are. I am not sad, there is sadness present. I am not angry, but there's anger that's passing through my awareness. So we don't want to become the feeling, I am this. But emotions are just emotions that arise, exist, and pass through our lives. They're natural, they're mentionable, and they're manageable. And the N stands for nurture. What can I do to nurture myself? with regard to this emotion? Do I need to talk to somebody? Do I need to rest? Do I need to write about it and journal about it? Do I need to take a hot bath? Do I need to light candles? Do I need to howl at the moon? Whatever it is, what do you need to do to nurture your soul when it comes to this emotion? And then just resting in the heart space that is here right now, breathing, and feeling your body, bringing some spaciousness to whatever feeling you brought into this exercise. 
And knowing that you can be with whatever it is, that you are more than these shifting, changing emotions. And then when you're ready, opening your eyes. And you can do a longer version of that. You can do a shorter version of that. What I like to do is I like to stop and acknowledge, recognize this is what's happening. Okay, let me allow for it. Let me give space for it. Let me not identify with it or my stories about it because our stories are mostly not true. <laughs> A little bit of it may be true, but a lot of times, most of the story is just a story, right? It's what we're telling ourselves about it. And then what can we do to nurture ourselves? We don't spend nearly enough time really holding ourselves with kindness and discovering what we need most in order to take care of ourselves. And it can be just acknowledging. I always put my hands over my heart because I always feel like I'm connecting with myself when I do that and bringing kindness to myself. So this is a wonderful technique and learning that um, we can be with our emotions without needing to fix them, without running away from them is one of the most, I think, important skills that mindfulness brings us. And um, so I really encourage you to practice with this one. All right, let's move to step three, surrender limiting beliefs. Um, we have, it's estimated, um, let's see how many um, thoughts um, we have here. So we have, it's estimated between, let's see, I forgot the number now, um, 50,000 to 70,000 thoughts a day. Wow, who knew? Most of them are unconscious. They're running around in our head. But yeah, I mean, there's actually research on this. 50 to 70,000 thoughts a day, unconscious, kind of like woo, 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 thoughts that go through our heads. And most of them are repetitive, negative, and not helpful, right? And if we're not aware and mindful, they can really like lead us down the wrong path. And they often do, right? So with mindfulness, we learn to listen to the thoughts because one of the most profound things I ever say to people and they go, what? Is that thoughts aren't facts. Even the ones that tell you they are, right? Our brains don't, don't generate thoughts. I mean, facts, sorry. Yes, they generate thoughts, but they don't generate facts. They generate ideas, beliefs, prejudices, and conditioning, right? Those aren't facts. So with mindfulness, we learn to question the thoughts in our, in our head because just because a thought came up doesn't mean it's true. So in the classes that I teach, these are the top 10 beliefs that I often hear when people come to a mindful eating class. I can't love myself until I blank, lose weight, get into those you know pants I got in 20 years ago, look 20 years younger, you know, get rid of my wrinkles, whatever it is. It's like stuff that's just not going to happen. Um, another thing that I hear about food is that it tastes so good, I can't stop eating, okay? There's good food and bad food. I'll eat as much as I want, watch me. That's the, that's the rebel, right? So people that restrict their food a lot eventually go all the way out and eat way more than they're comfortable with because they're rebelling against the rules and restrictions that they've put on themselves. Restricting food, which is happens a lot in our culture, is one of the worst things that you can do, okay? Diets don't work, right? Restrictive diets don't work because what happens is that then you rebel and then I'll eat as much as I want to, you watch me, often occurs. Um, I can't quit eating until my plate is empty. I don't think, I just eat. Food is my reward. Food is my comfort and entertainment. I've already blown it, as in diet. I might as well keep eating. I need to lose weight in order to be okay. These are common limiting beliefs that people have that come to my classes. 
So we can see all of these with mindfulness and we don't have to believe in them. We can know that we can love ourselves just as we are. We can know that food is just food. It's not good or bad. And we can begin to taste it and really uh, learn the foods that really respond to our bodies well and foods that we wanna keep eating because they taste good and they're nourishing to our body. And so we listen to the internal signals in our body as opposed to these thoughts in our head that tell us what to think and do. So the savoring practice that I have in this book and this section that I think is interesting is just to think about what's your current mantra. So in yoga, a mantra is a saying that we say to ourselves over and over again as a way of bringing ourselves into the present moment, but also cultivating some kind of positive effect. So if your mantra is, I can't love myself because, or I can't stop eating because, or I can't do this because, that's your mantra. Any thought that you have over and over again that you're allowing and that you're not stopping and investigating is your mantra, right? A lot of people's mantra in this culture is their to-do list. I can't tell you how many people, when I teach them meditation and, I, and they tell me what, what happened, it's, oh, I'm going over my to-do list in my mind. I, I mean, it is quite, quite prevalent. So make a new mantra, right? I accept myself as I am. I'm my own best friend. I love and accept myself. Whatever mantra you want to have, but just notice what are you using as your mantra? It may be an unconscious one that's telling yourself things that aren't very nice. Because in this culture, again, most people are very critical of themselves. And so there's a lot of critical thoughts that go through people's minds. Okay, so come up with a mantra that's gonna support you. All right, step four, smile and create your own happiness. So a lot of times people think, well, you know, mindfulness is just about being in the present moment. But, well, no, it's much more than that. It's about being in the present moment and being aware of what's happening so that you have choices. And it's in those choices, do two things. Number one, it helps us to see when we're engaging in activities that are harming us and we let them go, whether that's uh, thoughts that are harming us, actions that are harming us. We notice that and we let them go. And then we cultivate what is skillful and what is creating health and well being for us. We cultivate thoughts that are helpful and skillful. We cultivate actions that are helpful and skillful. That's as much a part of mindfulness as being in the present moment and noticing the things that are harming us. So I have a whole section on smiling and creating your happiness. So to access positive um, emotions, all you have to do is bring a slight but real smile to your lips many times a day, right? And I really, I teach people to smile in my yoga classes and in my other classes and people resist it. I'm so amazed sometimes that people resist smiling. And there's actually, I found this woman in London, in England who did this whole smile meditation. So one of the chapters in my book has this smile meditation in it. And so before you eat, just stop and smile and feel your belly and feel your body and bring these positive emotions into your body before you eat. So I love this, laughter actually increases your intake of oxygen, it relieves stress, it soothes muscle tension, improves your immune system, relieves pain, helps you cope with difficult emotions and situations and helps you connect with others. So smile more often. It, well, I, I also am an energy medicine yoga teacher and it, when you smile, it activates your radiant circuits, right? I just love that we can activate something called a radiant circuit simply by smiling, right? You can't be angry and smile at the same time. I have tried it and it's very hard to do, right? I spent one whole, afternoon driving back from Kansas City after I got an email from work that I didn't like and I'm like why don't you just try smiling Lynn and I started smiling and I couldn't be angry anymore because actually you're activating parts of your brain that tell you that you're happy and you kind of you know live into it right sometimes um, your smile so here's your smile meditation yeah, that's in, in, in the book. I'm not going to go through it right now, but it's in the book and you can go to it. And it's a lovely little meditation. And I love this quote by Thich Nhat Hanh. He says, sometimes your joy 
is the source of your smile. But sometimes your smile can be the source of your joy. And that is so true. Just try smiling, right? It'll connect you to others. It'll make you feel happy. Okay. Step five, savor every moment, right? So what does savoring mean? I, I love that when I started writing this book and I was talking about savoring every moment, savoring every bite, and I didn't really know this at the time, but what does it mean to savor, right? There's actually a definition. So there's a newer branch of psychology called positive psychology. And it says when one savors, one is aware of pleasure and appreciates the positive feelings one is experiencing. This implies that you could be experiencing something pleasant, but not savoring it, right? Because you aren't even aware of it, much less appreciating it. So the important ingredients for savoring are both your presence and your appreciation when pleasant sensations arise. So really be aware of the pleasure, the pleasant in your life. Acknowledge it, take a moment and, and just be present with it, right? Um, it'll go a long way. So one of the savoring practices that I have in this section is to let your breath be what I call the bell of mindfulness and breathe and notice the breath, notice any resistance that you're having to life in the moment, right? And just relax and savor. Savor the breath, savor your body, savor sitting, savor the moment that you have, right? A lot of this is about gratitude, right? Uh, bringing gratitude into our lives about what we have as opposed to what we might not have. Because the brain is as a funny thing. The brain is sticky for negative and Teflon for the positive. Okay. So it's sticky for the negative for reasons um, that developed many, many years ago when we were first, you know, we're here as a species because we needed to know when there was danger in our environment. But today it's gotten out of hand and we don't have as much danger in our environment, yet our brains are still looking for what's wrong and what could harm us. And so we have to really readjust and start focusing on what's pleasant, what's actually wonderful in our lives, because the brain doesn't automatically go there. We have to cultivate that as a skill. One of the most beautiful practices that I like to do is to wake up in the morning and really be thankful for that first breath that I recognize, because that means I'm alive. I woke up today. I have another day to live. And that's a pretty awesome thing, right? Have you thanked your body today for waking up? Something you might think about. All right, so there's many ways to practice mindfulness. You can do informal practices of mindfulness by just bringing awareness to things like brushing your teeth, taking a shower, making the bed, driving the car. Let's hope you're mindful while you're driving the car. <laughs> Don't text and drive. Um, while you're talking and listening, that's a great time for your mindfulness. Really anything and everything that you do is a mindfulness practice. From the minute you wake up in the morning to the minute that you go to bed at night, you can bring your kind, curious attention to it, right? And we cultivate that practice of mindfulness through these formal practices of sitting meditation, body scan, mindful eating, mindful yoga. And again, I have practices meditations on my website for all of these things that you can go to and listen to, download for free, or just listen to it on your computer. The key to getting good at mindfulness is practice. Practice, 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 even just a little bit every day, right? Just five minutes a day to start can help you begin to cultivate this presence so that you live a more conscious life, a more mindful life, a more joyous life you're worth it. All right, here's my two books, um, Savor Every Bite and the Mindfulness-Based Eating Solution, uh, which again, um, we talked about earlier. And I just wanted to give a little pitch for my Eat for Life program. Um, I've got another one starting in September. It's going to be on Wednesdays at noon. 
it's over Zoom, so anybody around the world can take it. And I still have some spaces left in there, but it's beginning to register. So um, all the information about that is also on my website. Very easy to find. Um, let's see. You can sign up for my weekly blog. I write about all the things that I do, plus thoughts that I have about mindful eating and living. Um, I have yoga classes online or in person here at Alley Cat, which is where I am right now because I just finished a yoga class <laughs> like two minutes before I jumped on this call. Um, so here I am. Um, and there's my contact information, everything you'd want to know about me. Um, so I want to open it up now for questions, comments, um, conversation, whatever you'd like to do. Uh, Lynn, I wanted to uh, mention Lori uh, just asked a question about halfway through your presentation about um, during the rain technique, what, what do you do when, when a lot of different emotions show up? This, this came in through the chat. Oh. Okay, yeah. So acknowledge them all. So you might be feeling lonely, you might be feeling angry, you might be feeling, we feel a lot of things at the same, I can feel angry and happy at the same time. Right? So it's not, it's like when we begin to, to open up our awareness to everything that's actually present. And this is actually one of the techniques that I teach in um, my class, when we're working with emotions is that I call it broadening the focus. Sometimes, you know, we're, we're so like gripped around the difficult emotion. Let's say maybe there's anger, right? So I could be having anger and I'm like, anger's, you know, just got a hold of me. And if I stop and I investigate and I broaden the awareness a little bit, I'll also be aware that at the same time, I could be happy about something else in my life. So when I broaden the focus, I realize I'm angry about this, but I'm happy about this. I'm confused about this, but I'm clear about this. I'm, you know, uh, there's all of these different emotions. And the more that you become familiar and you become, have this adeptness of labeling your emotions, you're gonna be able to identify more than one. And I also wanna add that, um, and I think it's important to acknowledge that there's more than one emotion, right? It's not just one thing. Um, and what you think you're feeling may not actually be what you're feeling. So I tell this story about when I was going through a particular um, period in my life, um, I often felt lonely. I'd have this, and I, I'd been practicing mindfulness for quite a while. So I would do the rain technique and I'd be like, okay, recognize the emotion I'm lonely and I allow it. And then I would investigate it. And I'm like, yeah, I'm lonely. Okay, so I have, my thought was I have no friends. And I was like, really? You don't have any friends? Um, and like, well, you have, you know, Susan and Robin and Terry and, you know, Sarah, and I'd, I'd keep counting them till I'd get up to 10. And I'd be like, okay, so you have all these friends, why don't you call one of them, you know, if you're lonely? And I'm like, I don't want to call one of them. And then I would get down to the fact that as I kept investigating this lonely feeling, what I would discover was I was tired. I wasn't even really lonely, because uh, I could have picked up the phone and called somebody if I wanted to or you know whatever I was really I probably had a little bit of sadness and I was mainly tired and sometimes when we're tired um, we can have a lot of emotions come up because of just the tiredness and if we would get some rest and sleep we'd feel a whole lot better I hope that helps and answers your question hmm other comments, questions? Well, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Catherine, go ahead. Um, well, I was just thinking, what if you have the same emotion, you know, day after day? Um, is this going to help you not have that emotion so much or um 
Well, so, so emotions come and go, right? So the only reason that an emotion would stay is because you're, you're, you, there's a story around it. Okay. So if you use mindfulness and you really allow for it to be there and you feel it fully and you investigate the beliefs and the stories that you're telling yourself about it and recognize that those are just stories and beliefs and then not identify with it as who I am, then you loosen the grip that the emotion has. And that emotion has a chance to pass through. The reason that an emotion keeps coming back up is because we're grabbing it and bringing it in. Right? I'm not gonna let go of this story. I'm gonna hold on to this story. And so the emotion is there, right? The emotion can't be there if you're not telling your, yourself a story about it. So when you let, see, I'm, I'm gripping. So when you, when you learn to let go, it's like, oh, you know, cause we have a lot of, sometimes we get a lot of ego around a story or a lot of story around the story or a lot of, you know, indignant, you know, feelings around a story. You know, I, I have every right to feel this way. Well, you can feel that way if you want to, but you're going to suffer, right? So if you want to not suffer, so mindfulness and mindfulness practice is in the, is in the service of lessening suffering. You can suffer all you want by clinging. Clinging creates suffering. Resisting creates suffering. If we resist the emotions that we're having because we don't want them, we still have a hold of them. Or if we wanna to cling to the story because we have every right to feel that way. Well, okay, great. You can do that as long as you want to, but when you're ready to let go, it can let go. When you're ready to say, okay, this is the story. I can see the story. I'm not the anger. I'm not the loneliness. I'm not the this let it arise and let it, let it subside. It will do that. And what can, and still emotions are difficult. They have an ouch to them, they hurt. So we bring self-compassion to ourselves. And when you do that, so I love the self-compassion practice and I, and I, don't, I don't talk a lot about it in my book, um, but it's very powerful. And one of my favorite practices is the one that Kristen Neff has, which is to acknowledge the ouch of an emotion and then to realize your common humanity with every other human being that walks the earth. Every single human being has felt pain, sadness, hurt, loneliness, anger. And when you can realize this, well, as another, a poem on called Kindness, when you realize the size of the cloth, Right when you realize that everybody is a part of the cloth uh, and has all the same emotions that you do, um, you realize, oh, it's not just me that's sad. It's not just me that's been lonely. It's not just me that's been angry. Every single person feels this, and so there's this kind of, oh, I'm I'm in good company, right? And then, <clears throat> what do you what can you do to nurture yourself, right? So make sure that you're nurturing yourself and taking care of yourself in skillful ways. What would be a skillful way to nurture myself so that I soothe myself from the pain of whatever it is that I'm experiencing? Does that make sense? Yeah. So in Buddhism, right, which is where mindfulness comes from, first noble truth is there is suffering. Second noble truth is the reason for suffering is clinging. The third noble truth is that there is a cessation of clinging. We can let go. And the fourth noble truth is then the eightfold path, the ethical guidelines, the things that teach us how to cultivate positive emotions, let go of the things that hurt us, and many other things. But I, I, the second noble truth that our suffering is caused by clinging, and mindfulness can help us to let go. Mindfulness can teach us how to be with the vicissitudes of life, which we all will encounter with a kinder, softer touch so that we don't continue to suffer needlessly.
I really think that mindfulness of the emotions is one of the most important um, things that I teach uh, in my classes is how do I deal with these emotions and thoughts um, in a way that teaches me that I can be with them and that um, they're manageable, All right? They're manageable. Lynn, I had a, a quick question. Um, there's a huge body of science and, and study behind the, the um, idea of intermittent fasting. What do you what do you think of of, of that as as part of you know, like a mindfulness practice? <laughs> not not a good idea. No, no, I'll answer your question. <laughs> have a lot of thoughts about it actually so you know um i think it's fine but but too many times things like that are used as another diet and that it sets people up into that restrict binge cycle um i think i kind of naturally do a little bit of that because i don't usually snack after dinner and I don't eat until I'm hungry in the morning. So in a sense, but I think that people have to listen to their bodies, right? So if, you, if you're if you starving before you eat in the morning, it's probably not a great idea. I don't know. I think we really need to learn how to honor our body's wisdom. And it's not going to be the same for every single person. That's like saying intermittent fasting for everybody. You know, well, why? You know, it's like, is that right for you? Maybe that resonates with your body. Maybe it doesn't. Um, but I think that we have to be careful not to set that up as another diet because the diet culture is very prevalent in this culture and very destructive to everybody because it sets up these ideals about how we should look and how we should be and how we should eat instead of listening to our own body's wisdom. Now, once you've gotten practiced at listening to your own body's wisdom um, and you see where it kind of, you know, if, if you aren't hungry till 10 o'clock, well, then you're, and then you're not really hungry after dinner because you're listening to your body, you might normally move into something that looks like intermittent fasting to some degree, but to force that model onto somebody um, before they've developed the capacity to trust themselves and their own body's wisdom, I think is doing them a disservice. And they probably won't last with it. That's the problem, right? Just like any other diet. Right, they're going to go back to eating the way they always did and still haven't learned to listen to their own body about what it wants to eat, when it wants to eat it, what it tastes like, does it even taste good, etc. So I think we have time for one more question. If anybody has any, any other questions at all. Well, I, um, I just want to say I, I really, uh, really enjoyed this, this presentation. It's, it's, it's been a lot to, to, to me to, to hear a lot of, of these techniques, and I'm sure everyone else um, learned a lot. So thank you so much, Lynn, for, for, for coming here tonight. And um, again, the, the contact information is up there on the slides. Um, and I wanted to also mention that um, uh, one of the one of the things you you mentioned, John Cabot Zinn. Uh, uh, the uh, I just recently started reading uh, Full Catastrophe Living again, and uh, it seems like some some of your ideas are really jive well with that book too. Absolutely, yeah. Well, I, I learned from him, so there you go. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. He was my teacher. Okay. Uh, yeah, so th thanks everyone. Um, I want to also mention that um, if you go to uh, dbrl.org forward slash events, uh, you'll learn about any upcoming library events that are coming um, and re also recordings of past events. We're going to have a lot more uh, stuff coming up this summer, um, hopefully some in-person sessions in, in the fall. Um, I, I'm, I'm really hopeful about that. I, I don't know 
uh, with the way trajectory of, of COVID, um, uh, what what things will turn out to be uh, in that in that sense. But um, I'm I'm looking forward to a lot more great programming. So thanks for for coming, everybody, and uh, I'll see you at the next at the next one. Thank thanks. you, Lynn. Yeah, thanks for coming. Good to see everybody. Thank you.